Dr. Luke, a medical doctor, a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, the first historian of the Christian church, reports Jesus' resurrection this way towards the end of Luke's gospel in chapter 24. Luke writes, But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they'd prepared, and they'd found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, Two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and crucified, and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. And so for the past approximately 2,000 years, Dr. Luke has announced this resurrection hope to countless people, and Luke wants us to know that the good news of Jesus' resurrection is a fact of history, not simply a function of religious tradition, that Jesus taught his followers that he must suffer and be rejected by the religious leaders, be killed, and on the third day be raised. And yet his closest followers are honest in that they did not understand what Jesus meant when he taught it. The women who care deeply enough about Jesus to risk social stigmatization, to go to the, that's a difficult word for the third service. Um, <laughs> You could try it at home. Uh, they, didn't, they could have been stigmatized for going to the tomb, but they cared so much about Jesus that they wanted to tend to his body, but they did not expect to find an empty tomb. That the men who lived and who traveled with Jesus for three years, who heard him teach, who watched him perform miracles, uh, who were under his guidance and his leadership, did not expect the tomb to be empty. And when the women came and reported to them, uh, they thought the report was idle talk, or which our Greek dictionaries would tell us uh, would be nonsense or humbug, that it didn't make sense to them, the words that the women were saying. Peter saw em Jesus' empty tomb, and he marveled. This marveling is something short, I think, of conviction or faith. Neither the ladies nor the apostles nor Peter were immediately aware that they were living through the most important event in human history, that the most important event that would ever happen had just happened. More than the ascension of a king or a party, a political or industrial revolution, a scientific advance, uh, that they were living through the transformative event of human history. And the men who wrote the New Testament, many of whom knew Jesus personally and traveled with him, and others who uh, knew the men who knew Jesus and were writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, spent the rest of their lives as they wrote the rest of the New Testament trying to apply the reality of Jesus' resurrection to the facts of daily life and to the flow of human history. If you were to turn up any page of the New Testament, I think you'd find someone uh, trying to apply the reality of Jesus' resurrection to the deepest questions of the human heart. Is there a God? Can God be known? If God can be known, what is God like? If God can be known and if we can know what God is like, would that God want to know me? Jesus' resurrection changes how we think about the pressing questions of our relational lives. How should husbands, wives, children's friends get along? How should people from death, different ethnic backgrounds get along? Are there right or wrong ways to think about human sexuality, treating people that we disagree with, caring for those with more or less wealth. And actually, last summer, we spent about 11 weeks trying to think through and apply the reality of Jesus' resurrection to some of these difficult topics. We had a sermon series called Freed to Flourish, and you're welcome to go back and find it online. We won't take all of these questions this morning, uh, but the point is simply this, that uh, for all of these questions that trouble and plague us as we go through life, the resurrection is the lens through which we understand God's answer. Is my life worth living? What happens after I die? How does human history conclude? The New Testament 
addresses each of these questions on the basis of what we celebrate this morning, the real historic resurrection of Jesus from Nazareth from real physical death to new physical life. Easter changes everything. And my goal this morning is to spend a few moments learning from the Apostle Paul, who was at least initially a man who not only did not believe in the resurrection, but was opposed to the idea of Jesus' resurrection. He was uh, vocationally opposed to it. He rounded up men and women who believed in the resurrection. At least at one instance in in the New Testament, he is reported to be at the execution, the martyrdom of one of the preachers of Jesus' resurrection in an approving way, thinking that that was a good thing to do. And yet, the Apostle Paul met the resurrected Jesus in real life. And that encounter with Jesus changed everything. And then uh, from that point onward, uh, Paul turned his intellect to try to understand how the resurrection influenced how we would think and understand God's truth at work in the world. And he traveled the known world as he was able to, preaching the resurrection everywhere that he went. And he wrote letters that included these reflections. And we're going to look at one section of his letter to the church in Rome, the capital city of the empire at that point in time, uh, where Paul guides our thinking about what Jesus' resurrection meant, what it means for us today, and what Jesus' resurrection means for the future. That's actually the sermon outline. It's simple, what Jesus' resurrection meant, what Jesus' resurrection means, what Jesus' resurrection means for the future. And we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 10. If you happen to bring a Bible with you, some of the verses will be on the screen, but you'll be able to follow along. First, Jesus' resurrection, what it meant. Jesus' resurrection is the most important revelatory event in human history. And by revelatory event, what I mean is revealing the answer to questions like, is there a God? If there is a God, what is God like? How can I know God? That the New Testament insists that these questions must be answered with reference to Jesus' resurrection. And Paul makes this connection in Romans chapter 10. In the context, Paul's immediate concern is for his fellow Jewish countrymen uh, who did not at that point accept the gospel message. Uh, They were opposed, as Paul had been opposed, to the message of Jesus of Nazareth being God's King and God's Son and Savior. And Paul ponders this, and he notes uh, that his fellow countrymen were people of high religious motivation. In verse 1 of chapter 10, he writes, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them, being his Jewish countrymen, is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They were highly motivated, and yet uh, the problem was that high motivation had not produced a real relationship with God. And Paul's observation remains challenging. As other commentators point out, spiritual sincerity does not guarantee knowing God in a saving way. And that challenges us, I think, because I think that that is our essential worldview, at least culturally, with regard to spiritual or religious things. Now, you could maybe not if you agree the masks are difficult to read on any Sunday, but I think that our way of thinking goes like this, that we accept as true that what is needed for a real relationship with God is sincerity demonstrated by effort. It doesn't actually matter what you confess belief in, as long as you believe in something. Uh, If what you believe in, uh, you believe in sincerely. And if the sincerity of your belief is marked by effort, then you're good. But Paul is saying that that's actually not what is true, that the sincerity and the zeal of the men and the women and the girls and the boys who were of the Jewish tradition, who had all of the Old Testament to inform them, hadn't resulted in a real relationship with God. It explains why in verse 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And what Paul means as he describes the righteousness of God is 
is that the character of God, God's holiness, God's perfection, God's moral purity, the, his, his absolute uh, high standard that he calls people to live out from a, a heart level outward in order to have a relationship with him. And we don't have to wonder uh, what that standard for righteousness would be. We, we don't have to wonder how it would be described. It's described in the Old Testament law. Uh, you could just think of the Ten Commandments. Thinking of the Ten Commandments, these describe what God's righteousness is like, that the law actually reflects on His moral character and the life that He calls people to live. Paul says that, that the people who had the law still didn't get God's righteousness, that the righteousness of God is His holy, perfect standard, and that being zealous and being highly motivated had not actually produced righteous living. It hadn't actually produced a, a real relationship with God. But when he says that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, what he means is that Jesus' life, death, and resurrection reveal God's character and reveal the limits of human sincerity and religious effort. When Paul says that Christ is the end or the goal of God's law, Paul means that Jesus and Jesus alone kept God's law in a holy, perfect, righteous manner. That Jesus showed by his life, in his relationships, through his words, what God's law was pointing to. But Jesus is also the end of the law because he kept God's law on behalf of all who would believe in him. So Paul is saying that where our personal zeal and sincerity cannot produce righteousness... Jesus' zeal and sincerity does. That Jesus' zeal and sincerity, that his law-keeping does please God. And this brings us to the resurrection and what it meant. What it meant in that moment, sometime after his burial and before the discovery of the empty tomb, in that moment when physically dead Jesus was raised by the power of God to new physical life, if you could have been there, if you could have seen it, and Paul says what it meant at that moment in time is that God accepted Christ's righteousness, that his resurrection meant that Christ is vindicated. He, he died a death that he did not deserve. He was charged with crimes that he did not commit. He lived a life that none of us could live. And having lived and having died on our behalf, as he walks out of the tomb, God says, pointing to Jesus, that counts. He's vindicated. We don't have to guess that that's what it means because Paul tells us at the beginning of the letter. Christ Jesus, Romans 1 verse 1 and verse 4, Christ Jesus was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Now, the verse does not mean that Jesus was not the Son of God, but then became the Son of God. That's not what the verse means. Jesus has always been the Son of God. What it means is that he was vindicated, that, that he as God's Son lived perfectly the life that you and I could never live, and that his life counts for us. Romans chapter 4. Paul says it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Justification means to be declared right with God, that when Jesus comes out from the tomb, not only is he vindicated, but everyone who believes in him is vindicated at that moment in time in the past. Jesus' resurrection meant God's acceptance of his perfect, God-obedient, always faithful life on behalf of us, regardless of the degree of our religious zeal, which waxes and wanes, regardless of the degree of our spiritual motivation, which waxes and wanes minute by minute and hour to hour, if we're honest, regardless of our sincerity Jesus' sincerity, his zeal, his obedience counts. Sincere effort to keep the Old Testament law or to pursue and keep any of the paths of any of the religions of the world, be it the five pillars of Islam or the enlightened path 
of the Buddha or to adhere to me or my social tribe's personal sense of right or wrong or simply to rise or fall uh, according to my own personal conscience. None of these things, Paul says, can establish ourselves as righteous before God. Jesus' resurrection meant that God accepted as 100% perfect and worthy Jesus' right living, which is good news for us that we're free from the path of religious performance, uh, that we're free from the the path of having to be uh, as zealous as the most zealous person. Jesus' resurrection meant that His zeal and His obedience counts. And what what it means for us right now today is that faith and not performance is how we have a relationship with God. This Paul describes in verses 5 to 8 of Romans 10. Jesus' resurrection what it means. And I want to think with you about this, particularly uh, with regard to what it means for personal identity and personal security. If you think about it, personal identity and personal security are huge motivators for life, aren't they? Motivators that drive so much of what we do from our educational and training paths to our vocational choices to why we work hard at our sports and hobbies to our financial investments to our relationships to to how we choose and use healthcare. Jesus' resurrection from death is the single most important event in human history with regard to identity and security, with regard to the question, who am I and where am I going? Who am I, where am I going, and how will I get there? So uh, uh, Paul contrasts the common but impossible hope that a person could be zealous and obedient enough to make ourselves right with God to faith. That's the contrast that he draws here. Look at verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. In other words, the, the, the law of the Old Testament is not a trick question. If it were possible for a person to keep all of the law, you could establish your own righteousness. The the problem is not with the law. The problem is with the end user, me, you. That's our problem, that we are natural lawbreakers. And the good news of the empty tomb is that we don't have to wonder how to get back into a relationship with the lawgiver. We don't have to undertake a difficult religious pilgrimage. We don't have to have a spectacular spiritual experience. You don't have to have a vision of heaven that stirs your soul. That's what Paul means in verses 6 to 7. He says, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. We don't need to bring Christ up from the dead because he is up from the dead. That's why we're here this morning, that he is alive. And that uh, what we celebrate today, Christ's resurrection, confirms God's character and how we have a relationship with a righteous God. His character is holy and fair. He's perfect and sin must be accounted for, law-breaking. God's character is gracious and merciful. He accounts for my law-breaking at the cross and counts me right through Jesus' law-keeping. Jesus' resurrection means that my personal security before God doesn't rest on my working harder at doing what was never going to work in the first place, but to believe that Jesus died and has risen for me. Paul explains, what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. There's our word again. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Identity, justified. Security, saved. Paul says that the way that we have this is to believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that means uh, not only believing in the event that we celebrate here on Easter Sunday in the fact of the resurrection, we do believe in that, but we believe in the totality of events that led up to it, that that the one who went to the cross is the God-man, that the one who is executed in our place is the God-man, that the one who goes into the tomb dead is the God-man, that the one who is raised is the God-man, the Messiah, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, uh, that we believe that He is the Son of God and that 
His vindication counts for my justification. If you believe this, Paul says, uh, then you can know today what Jesus' resurrection means for you with regard to identity and security at the end of your story. Verse 11, you can know today what the resurrection means today is how you can know how your story will end in the future. Verse 11, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Shame meaning to be dishonored or to be discouraged or disgraced or disappointed. Paul's speaking of that moment when every man and woman and girl and boy will stand before the throne of the righteous God to give an account for our living. And he says that there, there will be an outcome. And the outcome will be either to be put to shame or to be not put to shame. How is it that we are not put to shame? What's to find the right place to stand, so to speak? Verses, uh, uh, Paul quotes Isaiah 28 and 16. Therefore, says the Lord God, behold, I am the one who has laid a foundation in Zion, a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. These words in haste are translated in the Greek Old Testament to be put to shame, uh, but it's a wonderful picture. Isaiah the prophet is really describing the way that we live as we try to build our identity and build our security. He describes people really just scurrying about, being in haste uh, in, in the days of Isaiah, being in haste, scurrying about, trying to build alliances with the right people, trying to get in with the right powers, uh, trying to navigate and predict and, and contemplate the right future so that all will be well. Paul says, you, you don't have to, and Isaiah says, you don't have to scurry about your life. You don't have to be a scurrier trying to build your identity and trying to get your security. What you need to do is you need to, to stand on the, on the cornerstone, the Lord Jesus. He is the one who has been put into history that we might stand on and not be put to shame. He is the precious cornerstone. Believing in him will not lead to dishonor, disgrace, or disappointment, especially at the end of history when everyone stands before God to hear the final verdict. Paul says you can know that the resurrection means today, right now, on April 4th, 2021, what you will hear in the final judgment. Everyone who tries to follow the path of personal hard work or religious zeal or belief uh, that personal sincerity is enough will hear the verdict still guilty. Dishonor, disgrace, disappointment. Paul says it doesn't have to end that way. Everyone who believes in Jesus, who stands on the precious cornerstone, will hear forgiven, accepted, honored, welcomed as an adopted son or daughter. Identity not put to shame. Identity welcomed. Security safe on Judgment Day. Well, what would you do? Well, Paul says that how you would apply this truth is actually quite simple. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God has raised them from dead. And if you are here this morning and you're singing the songs and you're believing the words and you're hearing the scripture and you're like, yes, Jesus is raised for me. You already have the answer to your questions about identity and security. You have your identity in Christ who's raised. You have your security not put to shame. You can know how history will end for you. And if that's not true for you, then what better moment than Easter Sunday 2021 to stand on the cornerstone and say, I, 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 I want to know today how my story will end. What do I have to do? Do I have to go on a pilgrimage? Do I have to have a vision? Do I have to say special words? Do I have to have a moment? Paul says, no, you simply need to believe, to confess with your mouth that the God man died and rose for you. And then you'll not be put to shame. You'll be safe. That's what Jesus' resurrection means for us today. And Paul points us to the future. Thirdly, he says Jesus' resurrection and what it means for the future. Jesus' resurrection is the most important future-shaping event that's ever happened. If you think about the kinds of jobs that many, if not most, or all of us have, uh, they all connect trying to understand what today means for our future, right? Right? 
And if, you are, uh, if you're in a medical profession, if you're a doctor or a nurse or a technician, so much of what you do is to take today's test or today's lab work and you try to apply today to what the patient's future will look like so that you can help him or her. Some of you work in investing or banking or in financial planning, and uh, you try to understand today's events so that you can help your client's futures. A ship gets stuck in a canal half a world away, and you wonder, will Dave ever be able to retire? And the answer is no, Dave will never be able to retire. (laughs) Jesus' resurrection is a past event that describes clearly what our future will be. And Paul, I think, shows us two different Uh, parallel path, he shows us a a global application of this and an individual application of this, that Jesus' past resurrection points us to God's single solution for all persons from all backgrounds for all time. That God through Christ has one plan to save everyone who will be saved. Look at verse 12. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call him. The riches that are in view are the riches of salvation, the riches brought to you by the precious cornerstone, the the riches of knowing that you are welcome in God's family, that you are his precious son, that you are his precious daughter, uh, that you will not be put to shame on the day of judgment. And the same offer of salvation is for all people. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Think about all of the different sad ways that humanity invents to divide one from another. Whether we divide one from another, whether it's because of our ethnic background, whether it's because of our educational attainment, whether it's because of our social class that we have achieved, whether it is because of our income or all of the different ways uh, that we can divide one from another. Paul, writing in the first century, looks at their way of describing the basic division of humanity. The basic way that you describe divided humanity in the first century was to talk about people as Jew or Gentile. You were, you were Jewish or you were not Jewish. And divisions among people sorted out from there. Paul says that God has one plan to save all kinds of people, Jewish people and Gentile people. His way of saying all people. That all people who will be saved will be saved through the work of Jesus, through the work of the risen King. That that there is one global plan. What what a glorious reality it is that that at the end of history, uh, all who have gone through whatever era of history that we have gone through, experiencing all of the different divisions of humanity, and yet at some point in time in our life coming to believe in the Lord Jesus, that that we will all be before the Lord Jesus as one people. No more divisions. All of the different ways that we are polarized or angry or manipulative or abusive of each other will disappear. Jesus' resurrection means that the future of saved humanity is to be united in the Savior. Global future, but also an individual future. In verse 13, Paul quotes another Old Testament prophet named Joel who anticipated God's future saving work. Joel uh, wrote, And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone pointing us to those individual members of this collective whole. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We have an expression that goes like this, that that the past is a good predictor of the future. Have you heard that expression? Jesus' past is a good predictor, a very good predictor of your future. Easter Sunday is a very good predictor of your future. Paul in Romans chapter 6 says, if we have been united with him in Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Paul is 
conceiving and talking about the, the, the church being united spiritually to Jesus such that when Christ goes to the cross to die for the sins of the church, uh, it is as the, ch the church is dying with him and then being raised with him. And he is saying that if you look at Christ's resurrection, then you can understand and anticipate your own future resurrection, that Christ's past is predictive of your future. This is actually amazing good news. You think about what we have sung about and what we have celebrated this morning on Easter Sunday. We think of Jesus coming out from the tomb. How did his friends meet Jesus who came out from the tomb? Did, did they, they meet him as a ghost? Did they meet him as an apparition? Was he simply a, a, a collective, a fantastic thought of people who were overcome by their grief and so they imagined that Jesus was still with them while they tried to come to grips with this tragic reality of his life? Or did they actually meet and touch and sit down and listen to and eat with physically resurrected Jesus? Did not Jesus, in, in his first moments of resurrection appearance, say in the garden, don't hold on to me? Why, why would he say, don't hold on to me? if there wasn't someone to hold on to? Why does he sit down, resurrected Jesus, to cook a meal for his disciples? Why does he invite Thomas, who was skeptical uh, that Thomas might touch his wounded hands and wounded side, if there weren't wounds to touch, and if there wasn't a side to touch? Jesus is physically resurrected. He is not a ghost. He's not an apparition. He is alive again, new physical life after death. And, and we shouldn't be arrogant as we tend to, as all generations tend to be historically arrogant, at least a little bit, right? Like we think that we've got figured out what people who lived before us didn't have figured out as if like we're smarter, but they understood these things. <laughs> they understood death probably better than we did, at least in some ways, because they were much more proximate to it. They knew what a body was like. They knew what ghost stories were. They're talking to Jesus. They're touching Jesus. His past resurrection is predictive of your future in this way. His resurrection was bodily, physical, and identifiable, yet amazingly transformed. By identifiable, I mean that when people looked at him, they said, that's Jesus from Nazareth. I, I identify that, that that's the one whose mom was Mary. That, that he is in continuity with Jesus who lived before the resurrection. But he's transformed. He is not liable anymore to death, to illness, to sickness, to temptation, He's passed beyond that. Such it will be for you if you are a believer that his past is predictive of your future, that you will be raised. This is good news, that your resurrection will be physical, that your resurrection will be identifiable with, with the you that's walking around on April 4th, 2021, that you resurrected Christian will bump into another resurrected Christian and they will say, well, there's Dave from Dublin. And Dave from Dublin will say, well, there's Nate from Dublin. We'll know each other. It's, it's amazing good news that you can know today what your future will be like because Jesus is raised. Well, how would you apply this? Paul doesn't leave us to guess. He tells us in verses 14 and 15, how then will they call on him in whom they have not believed and how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? In other words, we apply it by believing it. Well, we apply it by believing what is preached. And you are all hearing it preached. So this means that you can all apply it. That, that you can all apply the reality of the resurrection preached to you. And you can say, yeah, that's for me. That's for me. And I've known it from my youth. Or I discovered it in college. Or maybe I'm just discovering it today. However it is, you can apply it and you can receive it. But having received it, then what do you do? Verse 15, well, you tell people about it. 
How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. This is an application not just for preachers, pastors, and missionaries. This is an application for every Christian. You understand that the most important event in human history has happened. Important things will happen tomorrow. There will be meaningful news headlines. But the most important thing to happen is not how the market is going to open, not how the pandemic is going to ease. The most important thing in human history has already happened, and you can tell people about it. That's what Paul is saying here, that, that you don't have to guess at what's really important. Lots of things are really important. But there's one thing that's the most important thing, and that's the resurrection of Jesus. And you can believe it, and you can tell others about it.